You know, in life we tend to do the same thing over and over again without really thinking, like looking in the refrigerator for that item that's never going to be there, or arguing with a friend who's never going to change their mind. I do that all the time. Or maybe you're looking frosting off the beaters of a handheld electric mixer without unplugging it from the wall. That isn't so smart. Well, today's show is about breaking bad habits. We're going to start with a stew. We're not going to brown the meat, we're not going to use any kind of canned stock, just water. And then we're going to take oranges, and instead of juicing them, we're going to turn them into a sophisticated dessert, which is called caramel oranges. It's from Italy. So today we're going to break some bad culinary habits to make great food. Stay tuned, and hope you enjoy the show. So for, I don't know, 35 years I've been talking about the Maillard reaction, which just means that when you saute meat, put it in a hot oven, you get a lot of flavor compounds developing. And uh, when you make a stew, you have to saute the meat in batches. That's what all the recipes say. And it takes a long time and it makes a mess. It doesn't smell very good. And the question is, do you really need to do that? And we looked around the world and most stew recipes actually use water and they don't actually saute the meat. So you got interested, I got interested, and uh, you went in your mind to Yemen. I did, I didn't actually travel to Yemen. One of the things I really like about this stew is it's a smaller amount of meat and it's all about auxiliary flavors. You have a lot of spices, you have garlic, you have a ton of herbs, and you have citrus, and a little bit of heat. So there's a lot going on. It's not a ton of meat. It's enough to really convey the flavors. It also has individual bright flavors. You know, most stews are melting pots. Everything tastes like umami or meaty flavor. Everything here is distinct when you get finished with it, which, which I really like. Let's start with our spice mix first. Okay. A tablespoon of sweet paprika that lays a sweet base, two teaspoons of cumin seed. Next, something that's a little more exotic to a lot of home cooks, we have a teaspoon of cardamom there and just a quarter teaspoon of cinnamon. So this combination of spices is used all over the Middle East. It's really fantastic here with the lamb. Two teaspoons of kosher salt and then a half teaspoon of fresh ground black pepper. So we're going to stir that up. And here's the thing. Spices serve double duty here. We're going to save half of it for later and we're gonna use half of it to coat our lamb. After the spices, one of the other key flavors is garlic. And I know how much you dislike chopping garlic. You talk about well, it. Well, no, let's see. I don't like mincing garlic, I don't like pressing garlic, and I don't like the garlic taste afterwards that sticks around for 24 hours. Yes, yeah, I, I think so. I, I'm rarely confused about how you feel about things. <laughs> Here's a great tip. It's a whole head of garlic, and it's this simple, Chris. Are you ready? You just cut off the top. You throw it in the pot. I like good? that. Yeah, it's pretty good. You peel off the outer husk so it doesn't fall into the well, soup. Just the loose part. The loose yeah. part. Yeah. Because you're not mincing it, you're not breaking it down. So it's just milder? It's milder and you get a flavor a lot like roasted garlic. We're going to put this in the soup. It's going to simmer. And when the soup is done, we're going to squeeze those cloves directly into the soup. And you get this really sweet, warm, rich garlic flavor that really ties everything together really well. As I said, the stew doesn't use all that much meat. We're starting off with about a pound and a quarter of lamb shoulder. So for those people watching who don't like lamb, you can use beef as well, like a chuck roast, right? You can, a chuck roast would be perfect. You need to add a little more water to the recipe and cook it a little longer. It's gonna break down slower, but it'll be just as good. Okay. So we wanna clean it up pretty well. I'm gonna cut it in half and always try and process it into smaller bite-sized pieces. You know, I, I buy this cut occasionally and it was so bad once. I bought two pounds, I got about a third of a pound of meat and one and two thirds pounds of fat. And I brought it back to the butcher and I said, you charged me for a pound and a two thirds of fat. So sometimes there's uh, not a lot of meat in there. One nice thing about this recipe, it's not dependent it on the meat. doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. Chris, I'm gonna finish cleaning up this lamb and then we can start with our stew. Okay. Now we're ready to cook. We have all our flavors ready to go. So we are gonna brown something. We're not gonna brown the meat. We're gonna brown the onions. We're gonna start off with Salted butter adds a really rich flavor to the stew, and we have just one medium chopped onion. And we're gonna saute this for about five to eight minutes until it's softened and really just beginning to brown. 
and that is your job. You get to buy oh, something to do. You do you get this to be a red letter my... day for me? Remember, I talked about the spices serving double mm -hmm. duty. Well, we're going to add half of that to our lamb right here. This is the fun part. You really get to sort of work it in, and this is important. It really helps get the flavors into the meat. I'm going to go wash my hands now, and don't let them burn. Okay? I think I can handle it. Maybe. <laughs> Chris, they're looking great. You did a good job not burning them. And at this point, they're, they're softened. They're just beginning to brown. We're going to add some tomato paste and the remainder of those spices. So toasting the tomato paste and the spices adds really rich, deep flavor without browning the meat. There's none of that sputtering fat, none of that mess. So the tomato paste does give you kind of a rich, meaty undercurrent. It also lends the broth a really beautiful color. Normally, soups like this would start with stock, right? We're just sticking with water. So much other flavor going on. Just six cups of water. Then we're going to bring this to boil, and then we're going to add our lamb and that garlic. So just a word about water. If you look around the world, in all these different countries, they, for soups and stews, they use water. They don't use stock. Stock's very Northern European. And if you think about it, it's cheap, it's clean, it lets the other flavors come through. Water's better. We're just about up to boil here. And now's the time we're going to add our lamb. And we're just going to pop that garlic in, cut side down. Now we're going to cover it, partially cover it, actually, so we can allow some of the evaporation and the flavors to concentrate, and bring it to a simmer. In an hour, we're going to come back and add carrots. If you add the carrots too early, they get really mushy, and mushy carrots are no good. Now, you know is a problem for me, because it's spicy, and I have a problem with spicy things. But we're going to take it from North Africa and bring it here and modify it a little bit, make it a little bit sweeter and maybe not quite so, so tough on me. Harissa started in Tunisia, and they already had spice blends. They had caraway, they had coriander, they had garlic, they had oil. And so in the 1500s, when uh, chili peppers showed up, and they came from obviously the New World, maybe up through West Africa or down from India, they just threw them into their spice blends, and that's what it was. And the term harissa comes from the Arabic harasa, which simply means to break into pieces. So they just broke up the chilies into pieces. This is a recipe that has changed and morphed and traveled. So I think it's perfectly acceptable for us to tone down the heat just a little bit for you. We're going to start with some dry New Mexico chilies. And you talked about ripping them up. That's all we're going to do. We're just going to rip up the You're chilies. You're harassing them. Yes. I'm harassing. Yes. Yes. We're going to harass the peppers to make the harissa. So you just want to get rid of the stems and the seeds, because the seeds are where all that heat lives. And we have four New Mexico chilies here. These ones, we already removed the seeds. And we're just going to dump them in here with a half a cup of neutral oil. So we're going to bring this up, and we're going to add six cloves of garlic. It kind of softens the intensity of the chilies a little bit. And if you leave the whole cloves, it's not going to burn. So it's just going to get nice and toasty. So you just tried to convince me by adding six garlic cloves, you're going to make it milder? Exactly. It's going to cancel. Well, you'll see. We're going to add some other sort of <laughs> nice, sweetness. Nice try. We're going to add some <laughs> sweetness later to really counteract the chilies. So to the chilies and the garlic and the oil, we're going to add a teaspoon of caraway, and we have a teaspoon of cumin. And what's really important is that you use whole spices, because if you use ground ones, they are really kind of dusty. So this is starting to come up to a simmer. And it's going to take about five minutes for the spices and the garlic to fry in the oil. OK, Chris, so it's been about five minutes. And you can see, look at the beautiful red color on those chilies. So we're just going to put all of this in our food processor. I do believe you, by the way. You do. When you say that to me, you're kind of worried that I don't believe you. Well, I know with chilies and you, I just feel like I need to. I like, I like a little more heat than I used to, actually. Maybe a little yeah. hand-holding involved. And the thing is, we think chilies and we think heat, but it's really about the flavor. I mean, these have this really kind of smoky, nice depth of flavor. The heat only comes from those seeds, which we got rid of, and then the cayenne that we're going to add at the end. So we have a half a cup of sun-dried tomatoes, one cup of roasted red peppers. And you do just want to pat both of these dry, because you don't want to dilute the beautiful flavor with you know, brine or water right. or oil, whatever these things are packed in. We want a little acidity, so we're going to add one tablespoon of white balsamic vinegar. If you don't have white balsamic, you could use lemon juice, which is very traditional. Or you could use white vinegar. You just want to add a little pinch of sweetness to kind of balance that out. Three quarters of a teaspoon of salt. And here comes your favorite part, Chris, the cayenne. I love a really Should spice. I just turn around while you add that whole right, thing so right. I'm not looking? <laughs> well, then when you taste it later, you might regret That's that decision. True. So I'm just going to add a pinch, and then maybe I'll add a bit more later. That actually was, excuse me, that was two pinches. You can't say it's a pinch. pinch and a half, Chris. And you go back into the bowl <laughs> twice. It's a pinch and a half. So we're going to blend this all up. OK. 
Okay. Isn't that beautiful, Chris? It looks great. It smells great, too. All right, so why don't you taste it? I actually got a couple spoons. And you can let me know if you need more cayenne. If I didn't put enough in there for you, we can add some more. Fruitiness may be the wrong word, but it's got some depth to it. It's not yeah. just all heat and spice. And in case you don't just want to eat it with a spoon, there's some other really great ways Which to Which I actually it. would do, because really it does impressed. taste great. It's delicious. So you can toss it with potatoes, roast it at a high heat. You could make a vinaigrette. But I wanted to show you just a really simple yogurt dip. That's an awesome appetizer. It's great with crudite. So you want to start with just two cups of full fat yogurt. And we're going to add three tablespoons. I'm going to do generous tablespoons, because it's so tasty. Because that's the kind of person you are. The kind of person I am. And then you want to add some fresh herbs. You can use a combination. We like to use a tablespoon of parsley and mint, and then one teaspoon of sugar. And it's just salt and pepper to taste. And like I said, this is great for crudite. You could also use it as a sandwich spread. All right, Chris, do you want to give this a taste? Yeah. Mmm. That is spectacular. Mm. You don't really strike me as a yogurt guy, so coming from you, that means a lot. Well, what do yogurt guys look like? I don't know. They look awesome? I don't know. They don't wear bow ties. You know, it's really not ketchup, but it's sort of like ketchup for grown-ups. It's got a lot of interesting flavor. It's spicier. It's got some fruitiness to it. I mean, I, I will throw out the ketchup and bring on the harissa. Thank you. You're welcome. A little more. It's been an hour and a half that that lamb has simmered, so it's really tender and really flavorful at this point. Our carrots are cooked through now, so let's go ahead and finish it. So here comes the fun part. So you see the garlic in there? Mm -hmm. All you have to do is squeeze it right in. You can see the cloves are coming right out, and they're so tender, they're gonna dissolve right into that broth. And you promised me no harsh garlic afterbite. No, you can smell it. You can smell that garlic, and it smells just like roasted garlic. It's very sweet and soft. So to finish it, we're gonna add chickpeas. These are just canned chickpeas. They work great in this case. No, little... no, 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 just wait, wait a minute. When we were developing this recipe, you said we're not using canned chickpeas. You were absolutely dead set against it. We had to soak them overnight and cook them. It doesn't matter here because we have so many okay. other things going on. And then we're gonna add some spinach. It's about three cups of little baby spinach. And this is gonna wilt right in and it adds some color and some more sweetness and more flavor. And it really makes it a complete meal in one bowl. We're gonna add two more things. So we keep building flavor layer by layer by layer. We're gonna finish it with a whopping cup of cilantro. So many recipes use a couple pinches of herbs or that sort of thing. Use tons of it, use handfuls of it. And then three tablespoons of lemon juice. About the juice of one lemon enlivens everything. Now, the idea of handfuls of herbs is, is common in the Middle East, and their recipes for stew literally says handfuls of herbs near the end. It's so odd that lots of places in the world use handfuls, and I grew up using half a teaspoon. <laughs> <laughs> We're ready to eat. It smells fantastic. There's two garnishes we like here. Okay. Greek yogurt, right there in the middle. We have our harissa here. It's not too hot, so I gave you a big dollop there. Mm. I'm sorry. The, you know, I've made American stews, beef bourguignon, and all you know, Belgian stews, and, and they're great. But they're monochromatic, and there's, it's, it's meat on meat on meat. And this has got you know, chickpeas and carrots, it's got herbs, it has spices. It's got a lot of things going on, which I think is really what we're looking for. Contrasting textures and flavors, and something on the fifth bite that's still interesting. So here at Milk Street today, we learned you know, a very simple, powerful thing, which is you don't have to saute meat for making a stew if you want nice, clean flavors. And secondly, you can use water instead of stock. And finally, you can use spices and herbs and all sorts of different flavors. So even on the fifth bite or the 10th bite, it's still interesting. I'm just supposed to say yes. Oh, no. yes. Yeah. I, I'm so okay. glad I finally made you happy. Mm. So let's talk about dessert. You know, most people in the world don't eat dessert like we do, right? I didn't eat it growing up. Pastries, cakes, those things actually are served sometimes in the afternoon with mm -hmm. some tea or coffee. Even tiramisu was something actually served in the afternoon. I was in Rome a few years ago in March, and they served for dessert, they had oranges, which were seasonal, with just peeled and uh, a little caramel sauce, which mm -hmm. I thought was a great idea. We did some research. This recipe's ended up in, in London on uh, dessert carts in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And finally, Nigella Lawson did a recipe in Forever Summer uh, about 10 years ago. So oranges and caramel. It's a great combination, Chris. And I love that we're typically used to eating just 
plain oranges or drinking a lot of orange juice. But this is really taking it to the next level and making a very complex but very simple dessert out of caramel and oranges. Complex tasting, simple to make. That's right, just the way you like it. <laughs> just the way I always like it. <laughs> what we have here are navel oranges, which are much easier to get all year round. But we also have tried this with cara cara oranges, which are more seasonal, but we're going with navel today. And those are a little darker color. They're a little darker in color. The flavor's a little bit different. You can mix them up as well if you get them, great. But if not, we're going with the lowest common denominator, just navel oranges, very simple. The tricky part here is peeling the oranges and we want to peel them in a way that gets all the pith off, all the skin and all the pith off. I'm going to show you how to Without do that. Without making an orange that's this big, because you took too much of the meat off, right? We want to keep the flesh and lose the skin and the pith. And we're just going to cut about a half inch off either end. Let me stand it on its end and we're just taking the peel right off. So at the bottom half, you follow down after the equator, you go in like that, right? Exactly. You're just following the curve of the orange all the way around. And we will have a chance to clean up any leftover pith. But you do want to make sure you take off all the pith to avoid any bitterness in the final dessert. Can you say pith three times fast? Pith, pith, okay. pith. <laughs> it's the pith. And we have here our orange. It's ready to be sliced. Slices are going to go straight into our baking dish. It's a simple dessert, but it's sophisticated and attractive. Kind of like me, huh? Just like you, Chris. Just like you. So I have here a total of six oranges that are going to be peeled and sliced and layered into the dish. And you'll notice that I have a couple more left over, and that's I was I was worried about those. I didn't know. Orphan oranges. Orphan oranges. No, no. No, no such thing. Mama Reina does not allow. <laughs> All right. So I have here our oranges layered out into a dish. And then these two I'm going to juice and use that juice in the caramel sauce. So Chris, we're ready to make our caramel. A lot of people get very nervous about caramel, but I love this recipe because it's actually quite simple. Do, do, do I look nervous? You never look nervous. I'm very <laughs> calm about caramel. So we're going to start with one cup of sugar. And it's important to note that you use white sugar for this. Brown sugar has some impurities in it that don't allow it to get up to the temperature that we want. So we're going to use a cup or seven ounces of white sugar. And then we're going to use one of my favorite spices, which is star anise. Nigella uses uh, cardamom, about six pods, lightly crushed, which is also really wonderful. And if you have neither of those, uh, cinnamon sticks are also fine. You can use two sticks of cinnamon. But we really love this very complex, sweet flavor of star anise. So, so if I use cinnamon sticks, you wouldn't respect me anymore. Yeah. No. I didn't think so. <laughs> That's right. And then out of the oranges that I juiced, I got three quarters of a cup. And I'm using a quarter cup of that right into the sugar there. Adding the orange juice helps speed up the caramelization process and also add some of that orange flavor straight in at the beginning of our sauce. Now I'm going to get this going on a nice medium-high heat. The thing with caramel in this recipe is that you don't actually have to worry about the color for quite a while. So one of the indicators we're going to use is looking instead at the bubbles that are formed once the sugar starts heating up. So you see now we're starting to get up to a boil point and the bubbles are actually thin and frothy, which is a good indication that's just bringing it up to boil point. And what we're looking for here is a point at which the bubbles turn from thin and frothy to thick and shiny. I'm going to give it a quick stir just to make sure the heat distributes nicely. So right now it should stay on medium high. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't be concerned or panic that it's frothing a lot. No, no and panic. And the three, I can't see any color other than the orange juice color. There's no coloring yet. And if you're concerned about the color, there's a quick and easy way to check through the bubbles. You just kind of move this off the heat, give it a little bit of a stir, and that incorporates some air into it that lets you see the color a little better. We don't have the color changing just yet, so we're going to wait. This is a caramel of patience and courage. Not your kind of <laughs> Yeah, this is not my kind of recipe, folks. Uh, <laughs> courage, maybe. Patience, no. no. So you can start seeing now there's some color developing on the edges. And the bubbles have changed. You can see that there's more thick and shiny bubbles. This and time, now I can see the color. You can yeah. see the color, yeah. And at this point, we really want to be paying attention. As soon as it starts turning color, 
I'm going to turn my heat down to low and let it continue to cook. Because it can go from the right kind of caramel, which is a, a new copper penny, to burnt quite quickly. So just to interject, if you don't cook this enough, it's just sweet. Mm -hmm. And part of the objective here with a sweet orange is to have a slight bitter undercurrent in the caramel. That's so you want a exactly. little sweet and bitter, bitter and sweet. Mm -hmm. But if you overdo it, like it gets black or really dark brown. Then it's th too bitter. Then it's really bitter and it's, it's pretty nasty. Actually. So I'm turning off my heat right about now because this is just right. This is still a very hot mixture. I'm going to add in our butter next. And we want to make sure we do so carefully so it doesn't spatter everywhere. This is two tablespoons of salted butter, bittersweet and salt. It's a nice grown-up taste. I'm going to give this a quick whisk. The butter is also helping to stabilize the sauce and add some richness. Now that you whisked it in, you can really see the color. Now you can see it because the bubbles are subsiding. And you can see that's a gorgeous that's caramel color. The next thing that goes in is the remaining half cup of orange juice. And I'm going to pour that in. Now remember, this is still very, very hot. We're going to pour this in very slowly and continue to whisk. So we're going to continue to whisk. And the rest of our juice. People are used to different consistencies of caramel. There's all kinds. This is a little bit thinner, but it works really well with the oranges. And it just gets poured straight on top. This goes right in. It's really nice. I'm just going to cover this with plastic wrap and refrigerate it for at least three hours, up to six hours. We want to chill it for a little while, and then we'll be ready to eat. So Chris, we're at your favorite part. It's time to eat dessert. Our caramel oranges have been refrigerating for about three hours. You can see that the sauce has changed a little bit in how it looks because the butter solidifies a little bit, and that's totally fine, nothing to worry about. And then we're just going to serve these up. You're not thinking that you're not going to give me a lot of caramel sauce, oh, are I'm, you? I'm getting to the sauce. I, no. What I like to do is give it a little bit of a stir just to reincorporate and mix in any juices. This recipe is really nice because you can serve the oranges with several different things. They can be served with ice cream or cake or both, which I'm sure you would love. But I think you'll also really like the way we serve it with some Greek yogurt. It gives it some tang and creaminess without a lot of sugar. You know, 10 years ago, nobody was eating Greek yogurt. And now it's it just on became everything. This thing. Yeah, it became yeah. this thing. And for good reason, because it's It's delicious. Quite good. And it gives it a nice balance. I think you've got bitter and sweet. You've got creamy and cold and tangy and crunch. We use chopped toasted pistachios, which I think add a wonderful layer of flavor. All right, ready to eat? Sir. That certainly looks good. Mm. It's really not very sweet, but it still gives you that dessert fix. Bitter and sweet, hence the term bittersweet. That's right. So what we learned today at Milk Street was to make a caramel sauce that is just slightly bitter, and it goes perfectly with fresh fruit, which is oranges in this case. Of course, some Greek yogurt on top and some chopped pistachios. But that combination of bitter and sweet, which is not a very American tradition, but it is a tradition around the world, really mm -hmm. works great in this dessert. You can get all the recipes from this season of Milk Street on our website, which is MilkStreetTV.com. Thank you.